there are two things I'd like to at least see happen today. One is uh, we want to hear Bob go through his presentation on electronically assisted uh, astronomy. And uh, then I'd like to talk about, you know, where we as a subgroup of the, of the club want to focus our energies on. And it has to be in areas that interest you most. So the discussion will be uh, giving you some uh, um, Larry and I have been talking and, and we put together some ideas of what we could do as a, as a subgroup, but uh, look for feedback from you on that. So without uh, much ado, uh, you all know Bob, probably doesn't need any introduction. So Bob, take it away. Okay. Okay, uh, tonight I uh, want to share with you uh, an introduction to electronically assisted astronomy and in the process of showing you what it is, show you what I've learned and what I've yet to learn. So uh, the questions you might have are, the, are these four is just what is uh, EAA? Why would I want to use it? How does it work? And what can you see? Uh, it's somewhere between visual astronomy and astrophotography. I feel kind of bad since this group is focusing on astrophotography, and it's this is probably uh, several steps down from that, as you'll see. Uh, basically, what you do is a camera is replacing the um, eyepiece on the telescope, and you're looking at a computer or a, a screen to see uh, the objects live as you're looking at them. Uh, it, because the cameras are much more sensitive than our eyes, you can uh, see faint objects. And if the software allows it's, uh, monitoring the camera, you can uh, stack the exposure and see uh, a lot of extra detail. Because they- Can I ask you a question, stop you for a minute? Uh, do you want sure. questions as we, as we go along or do you want to see the questions at the end? Uh, let's do it as we go along because it may, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, there's no need for long exposure, or at least I found that there's no need for long exposures and that, I mean, all of the ones I use are less than 30 seconds. So you really don't need a, a, a polar mount, an alt azimuth mount will do, and there's no need for uh, tracking or guiding uh, in uh, EAA. Uh, why do you use EAA? Well, it's a great way to see faint objects, particularly in light polluted areas. Uh, I've read several places that it's like uh, uh, having a virtual uh, aperture, raising it about three times what you are, so your scope can remain lightweight and still have uh, the effect of a, of a large aperture on your telescope. Uh, if you're using a color camera, you can. Uh, it's a better way to see colors. The cameras are much more sensitive than the human eye to the colors that are uh, available in the, the nebula and uh, objects up there. Um, it's an alternative to direct observational viewing. And for me, this is exactly why I started it because I have uh, some fairly poor eyes and uh, I'm not the most mobile person and cranking and getting in various positions was, was difficult. And now uh, it's much easier for me to view and my wife can uh, be a part of it. It also lends itself uh, for children and outreach things where you can see a lot of people can see in the telescope without having to crowd around the eyepiece and, and uh, the telescope. Uh, the power of the software that you're using can improve the live, in, in the live images and uh, provide some subtle details as the uh, as the goes on in stacks. Uh, it allows you to uh, take a uh, capture a picture of it uh, for uh, share with others or provide documentation. And I usually uh, capture a picture of everything that I see just so that I can check it off on the box. And uh, most of the time I don't go back and uh, I very rarely do any post-processing on anything. Another uh, 
thing is it can provide to be a gateway to astrophotography. In other words, it can just start getting your peak for the interest of, of better and more sophisticated photographs and, and more detail and, and stuff like that. What are the downsides of EAA? It's not all positive. Uh, the large, sensitive, uh, large sensors and uh, highly sensitive cameras can be expensive. Uh, so it's another place where you can pour money into a hobby. Yeah. Uh, you do need additional e equipment with it. You need a laptop, some software, a power source, potentially a focusing mask, focal reducer, etc. So it's just, uh, it, it adds some extra equipment to bring to the field with you. Uh, this is one where our club is very uh, generous to me. It's uh, our light um, etiquette at the dark site is fairly uh, forgiving, but if you're in a, a club or at a dark site where the light etiquette is strictly enforced, uh, the computer screens can be a, a very big problem. Um, even even though you may be using you know red uh, red screens, is that okay or is that uh, still? Yeah, the, the software I use has a, a night mode. Most of them have night modes, yeah. uh, but uh, they still cast some some glare, some you know some light yeah. that's, that's out there that, that isn't pure red. Uh, some people argue that it's uh, disconnected from the real things. The photons re aren't going directly into your eye. And uh, a downsize can be that you're on the slippery slope toward uh, astrophotography. So uh, you, if you, uh, you can get sucked into something that's uh, much more detailed and uh, time consuming and, and become uh, very complex. Uh, the hardware that's involved is, uh, includes everything that you would use for visual uh, astronomy, plus a telescope, a mount, camera, laptop, focal reducer, some filters, and a visual back. Uh, my hardware specifically, I have the Celestron Evolution 8-inch Schmidt cast grain. Uh, it's an alt azimuth mount. My camera is a ZWO 290 color with about 2.1 megapixels. The uh, laptop I use is a junker I bought for uh, cheap at a used store. Uh, it has a very low power processor. Uh, it does have 12 gigabytes of memory. Uh, I did splurge and bought the Night Owl 0.4 focal reducer that uh, allows the, uh, the telescope to come from an F10 down to an F4. And I use a light pollution filter. And uh, the whole thing is on a two inch, di a, a two inch visual back with no diagonal. And that does cause some problems as you'll see if you want to go uh, as close as you can to the zenith. Here's the, the equipment on my scope. You can see the visual back. Uh, there's a spacer and a focal reducer. Uh, the spacer was needed to get the right uh, back focus for the camera. And the camera is the typical red ZWO. Uh, it's a non-cooled camera, uh, which to date hasn't caused me a lot of problems, although I haven't really compared some of the work in the summer with that in the winter to see if there is a, a temperature difference for from the, the photographs. And do you notice anything, Bob? Uh, I personally don't, but uh, I don't have the best best eye, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think one of the, the hardest things, if you ever got using uh, darks or uh, things like that, where you want a, a cooled camera will always allow you to go to the, the, a more constant, consistent temperature, uh, which now you'd have to take a dark based on the temperature as it changed throughout the observing session. Um, the software I use has general functions, the go-to steering and the camera control and image uh, formation and adjustment. For the go-to, I basically use the hand controller that came with the telescope. Uh, at times, I will use Stellarium to guide it, uh, predominantly for when I want to look at things that aren't in the catalogs in the hand controllers. Uh, the camera control and imaging software, I use SharpCap. Uh, I have dabbled a little with ASI Studio, which is uh, free software from ZWO. And I'm beginning to play with Fitz Liberator versions three and four uh, to look at some of the... Uh, 
saved programs or saved photographs if they're in the FITS format. Uh, all of the software there is essentially free. I mean, the hand controller came as part of the telescope cost. Uh, SharpCap is a $15 um, a year uh, rental fee uh, for the pro version, which is what you need if you want to do uh, the stacking and stuff. Are you going to talk about what you do in uh, SharpCap? Uh, yeah, I'll show the basic sharp step screen and walk through the, uh, the process. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, the setup uh, work process is basically like visual. You set up the tripod mount, telescope, and a camera or setup. I do use StarSense to align the telescope. Uh, the laptop, I then connect to the camera and uh, start the control imaging software with a sharp cap. I connect the camera at the very latest since the battery in my uh, laptop is not the uh, strongest one and it is powering the camera too. Uh, the scope is then uh, focused on a bright, a moderately bright star and I focus using a Betnoff mask. Uh, this part of it is also good because it allows me to see where that object will be in the uh, field of view. And uh, so, you know, depending on how the alignment went, it's sometimes closer to the center of the field of view than other times. So this gives me an idea of where I'm going to look for the objects when I uh, get to the, the work. Uh, for those that haven't ever used a, or seen a Betnoff mask, this is one for the Celestron. It's got the hole for the uh, secondary mirror. You place that over the, essentially lays right in front of the corrector plate. And when you look at a star, you see a pattern like on the right. And when it's in focus, um, the middle spike splits the uh, triangle, the, the, the two side spikes. And you can see the inside and outside focus things there. SharpCap does have a function that will look at this image, this focusing image, and give you some kind of directional uh, feedback. Yes, you know, a, a measure that you try to minimize by. Uh, moving the focus so it can help you that way if you just don't want to use your eye. I find it my eye is just good enough for what I want to do. Uh, the EAA work process, and this is where ask some questions. I mean, if you want to get more technical, uh, basically I use the hand controller to select and move to a target. Uh, I set the exposure down uh, fairly low to certainly less than five seconds down to maybe one second or two seconds and increase the gain so that you're almost getting enough. So you're, you might be introducing a lot of noise or into the picture where it gets kind of grainy and, and noisy from high gain. And this is because as you're trying to move and center the target, uh, you don't get to see the picture until each exposure is over. So if you have a large exposure, it, it jerks and it, you, you make an adjustment, got to wait 10 seconds. So, uh, and once I have the object positioned uh, to my liking, I then adjust the exposure time down uh, to a, a fairly low level and reduce the gain uh, or adjust the exposure time up a little bit and reduce the gain down to around 200 or 250 for this camera. And then I begin asking, uh, start uh, the uh, sharp cap to begin stacking the frames. And it gives you a, a counter that shows if each frame is stacked. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead there. It says, if you find that it isn't stacking, uh, basically what I tend to do is increase the exposure or the gain or adjust the centering of the object. And basically what I found is if it doesn't stack, it's because it's not seeing enough good crisp stars to uh, be able to align each frame uh, with its algorithm. So by uh, repositioning, sometimes you can include more background or foreground stars um, and to help it uh, begin stacking. And then so, you play, yes. So Bob, Bob, your focal length, if I uh, just calculated roughly in my, my brain here, it's about 800 millimeters. Yeah. So, yes. so, you, so you're looking at objects pretty close. Um, do you have to keep adjusting your uh, bringing the target back into field of view because you're not doing guiding? Uh, or, or, or you find that's okay? I, I find it's okay. Uh, 
you know, it, it stays fairly, uh, once you, if you don't have any uh, gear backlash or anything like that, it's occasionally after it's moved, it takes a while to get the, the gears set up right, and it tends to creep a little bit. But once it's on, uh, the only so thing you can just do is side to real tracking, basically. You right. Set that on. Okay, yeah. got it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then usually once it's it's got a fairly good exposure and I've been able to tweak it with the histogram to get what I want, I usually save a an image of the stack, the, of the a copy of the stacked image in both a PNG file and a FITS file. Uh, and I've just recently started to play around with the, uh, uh, the FITS file uh, to see what more post-processing or learning I can do. Here's the typical screen for sharp cap. And I know it's kind of busy and it's hard to, to see. What, what you're seeing here is in the upper left corner is the image um, area. And what I'm showing on this one was it has a built-in uh, practice camera and it has the Orion Nebula, Nebula as uh, the object. Uh, the camera controls are all over on the left side. Uh, or the right side of the camera. There's uh, the histogram that's showing here that you can play with the white and uh, black, dark, and uh, mid-tone balance is for the live image. Uh, it's also where you control the, the gain and the exposure. And, this, and what's shown here will vary based on the camera that's, uh, that you're using. And down below on the, the lower thing is the stacking area where it keeps track of the frames stacked. Here it says it's stacked 40 frames, it's ignored 15. Uh, and then it keeps, it's uh, basically, uh, we've got 40 seconds total exposure. And this is the histogram that will play around. This histogram affects the stacked image where you can adjust the uh, uh, dark midtones and white levels. It also has the ability to do an auto adjust and the color balance too can be done uh, automatically or you can use the sliders for the red, green, blue, and uh, white balance. Question, Bob. The um, image that's in the, the bigger win window, is that an individual image or is it the stack as it's being built? Uh, it is the stacked image. When, when you're in the live stack mode, it will be the uh, stacked image. If you stop live stacking, it will go to the uh, uh, live image. Thanks. And, and Bob, uh, do you have to pre-record uh, the docks and lights and some any camera biases or whatever? So if those things get subtracted while you're stacking or, or you just stack whatever you're capturing? Uh, you can up up here under uh, under one of these up here, and I, I wish I was well. Maybe when I when I finish the presentation, I can go fire up Sharp Stack or Sharp Cap and show you. But there up here is one of the the abilities to capture. You can capture darks and uh, flat frames with Sharp Cap, and then and, and then down here in the uh, processing area is where you would go out and pick those files. So it's it's adding those in every time it stacks. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I could have taken a short answer to your question, yeah. No, I know AS, ASI uh, Studio does that because I use it sometimes. And I was just wondering if Sharp, Sharp kept in too. Right. Uh, Bob, can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. Did you say this was, uh, this was like a, picture that's in the program for you to play with or is this something you shot no this is a picture up here on the top left where it says cameras if you choose if you hit that it'll show the various cameras like if you have one hooked up it'll find yours and there's one here called test camera that okay. allows you to play with the functionality without having to have a camera hooked up to it okay and so the Good. Yeah. Good. And this and this is like a $15 a year program. Yes, you can you can uh, download the free version. And okay. uh, and it's very clear on their website where the pro and the free version ends off. I think I think it even the free version will even stack, but I'm not sure 
you have the ability to have this histogram to play with. Uh -huh. And it's, it, I pay for it with PayPal. Uh, Robin uh, Glover, I think is the, is the author and he's in England. So it's like, it comes out to be 15 US dollars, I think, so. Just following on uh, John's question, um, uh, this, it says live stacking here, but can you have a library of images that you have already taken and run this in a mode where it pretends like it's taking pictures, but is actually using pre-photographed images and stacking them for you? Yes, if you go to, if you go to cameras, there'll be an option that says uh, folder camera or something oh, okay. like that. So you oh, give it the right, folder yeah. and it's it'll suck in the images from the folder. Okay, good, good. I might try that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions while we're here? Uh, just, just real quickly, uh -huh. is this one of the most popular programs? Did you find, find this works best for you? Or, or how did you come about with, come up with this chart? Uh, when, when I asked the people at Star Arizona, this is what they recommended. And okay. so I downloaded the free version and played with it. In fact, the camera I used was the uh, the camera on the PC, you know, the one that you're looking at that shows yeah. you, because that pops up as one of the cameras it can find. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can play with the, you know, the gain and the stuff on it, just to, you know, there's it won't live stack because it can't find any stars. So, so if, if you want to do planetary work with this, then you have to do more of the uh, captures where you would capture uh, essentially video and then use programs that would essentially deframe, uh, bust each video into, into fr single frames and then stack them in, in ones that are more for planetary work. I can't remember the names of them. Uh, Bob, I recently got a low end uh QHY camera, and they recommended this for uh, the free version for uh, initial processing and learning. And then they also recommended for videos to use something like Registrax, Registax. Okay. Which, which separates out the frame, takes the video, separates the frames, and lets you use different algorithms to, to, to okay. the best and stack them. And that's okay. also a freebie. All right. When, when I get to what I want to learn and do more with, <clears throat> My setup isn't very good for planetary work right now. <coughs> so what I found is working for me. Um, I have a lot more enjoyment using the telescope and looking at things than when I had the eyepiece. So far, I I've, I've keep track of everything I do. I'm a little anal about that. I have observed over 90% of the Messier objects, and I'm trying to work my way through the, the, the complete list. Um, the globular clusters and bright nebula uh, are great through this, uh, at least through my camera and the way I've been doing it. Uh, I have all, I have started now using the website Telescopus, I think I pronounced that right, uh, to compare my camera frame with objects so that I'm not disappointed uh, and don't have any false starts. Like the first time I went to see Andromeda, uh, I barely could get the core of the galaxy in the frame. <laughs> That's just too damn big. <laughs> and then, then vice versa, some of the nebula that uh, you see Hubble is taking a picture of, I look up on that and it's like a pencil eraser in the center of the frame, you know? So uh, at least I don't get my heart broken uh, too, too often. Uh, I have found that galaxies can be difficult to coax out the details. Uh, it's kind of sometimes I swear it's hit and miss. Uh, and I have added an extra monitor uh, to show images uh, in outreach mode and during the COVID-19 so people weren't like breathing down my neck uh, and it kept my wife happy. So, so that's what's working for me. Uh, places that I've uh, got learning to do is, like I alluded to, the current configuration is not good for planets. Um, I want to investigate a cooled camera, maybe one with bigger pixel, uh, with more pixels and a bigger chip size, so it can see more of the bigger field of view. If I don't get that, I want to learn how to take some mosaics uh, for larger larger objects. Uh, I'm playing around now with the FITS file format and, and some post processing. 
uh, and that's a real wormhole to go down. Uh, and I want to experiment more with some dark frames and flat frames, although I've read with very short exposures, uh, the dark frames may not be all that helpful, uh, but we'll see. I do, uh, the camera does have a few hot pixels, so I think it would help there, so. For live stacking, Bob, uh, you said you, you had some issues with galaxies. With galaxies, are you, 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 besides just histogram, playing around with the histogram, is there anything else you can do uh, uh, to, to those images as they are being stacked live or you just uh, uh, wrong? Well, in the, in the field out there, there's not, not much that I have figured out to do. Maybe, maybe there is some stuff to do. Uh, when I say it's kind of hit and miss, I swear, you know, like one day I can, uh, I can see a galaxy very clear and the next time, you know, uh, it seems like it's very hard to get the, uh, the image is crystal clear and the details it shows as last time. I don't know whether it's the scene, the temperature, the cameras varied. How long is your exposure? Uh, anywhere between 15 to 30, and the most I ever go is 30 seconds. So, okay, because for some of them I've had to go 50, which is the longest I go unguided. Okay. I, I have a uh, equatorial. Okay. Well, I might try that. I mean, the worst I can do is start seeing <laughs> some uh, weird stuff. So, you'll see circular trailing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, so here's some, uh, I want to show some, uh, some uh, EAA in action. And uh, keep in mind that. Pretty is not really the goal here. So uh, what I've showed for each one is the number of frames that were stacked and the exposure for that stacking. This is one, this is the Crab Nebula. So it did bring out some of the color. Mm -hmm. And you can see uh, around the bottom and, and one of the edges, you'll see the, the there's a kind of a black frame that, that's because as you stacked 14 images, it's having to have to tilt the frame each time. So you build this kind of, uh, if you really wanted to pretty it up, you go in and crop out that, that, uh, that stacking uh, nuance. So is this the result of uh, live stacking? You've done no, no pre-processing, no, post-processing? No, this is, this is the way it came out with live stacking as a, as a uh, PNG file or PGN or whatever, whatever page. Bob, Bob, does your software have a capability for gamma stretching? Uh, I'm not sure. In, in live stack, it, it might not. I mean, I could put it into, uh, I don't have Photoshop. I use, I've been playing around with GIMP because it's free. The, yeah, this looks like what I get when I, when I do a linear process, but if I gamma process it, uh, I can get rid of the, the sky glow and sharpen up the interior quite a bit. So I'd have to do that with the FITS file, right? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I believe so. I, I only use FITS and then save the FITS and save a JPEG when I'm done. Bruce, right. Bruce, can you explain what gamma stretching is? I mean, it's new to me. Your, your pictures normally are, well, depending on the camera, you're anywhere from 12 to 16 bits. Your monitor can only handle eight bits. And that's why JPEG formats are 8-bit. So you can either, you normally set the dark and the bright or contrast and intensity controls on your software to get what you want, and then drop the LSBs to uh, get it down to 8-bit. Or you can use a nonlinear approach, which I'll normally set the high end and the low end, and then plot it so it's on a, a curve rather than a straight line. And you can change the shape of the curve to which areas you want more detail, more levels of intensity gradation in. Yeah. Okay, is that uh, is that like the curves thing in in uh, GIMP okay. or, or GIMP? I, yeah. I, I, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with Photoshop. I normally use uh, PaintShop Pro when I do when I do pretty pictures. But all my processing is all done with uh, Maxim DL. Okay. Which also controls my camera, my guider, and my focus. Okay. So that's one of the things is everybody's using like GIMP is not exactly like Photoshop is not exactly like, so everybody's it's, it's yeah free Bob is free so yeah that's uh, that's good, what my good, wife good thinks good to learn on anyway yeah and this is uh, the dumbbell that's sixty four frames um, at fifteen second exposures 
And, and this, uh, the redness you see in a lot of the stars, is that an artifact of just stretching? Probably, okay. or poor color balance or something like that, yeah. I think it's color balance. Yeah. And uh, also, I don't know if you've, you've zoomed in on this, but it looks like it has a, fo it's a little bit out of focus. The stars are kind of huge. Okay. Yeah. What, what is, uh, what was that uh, image of? The dumbbell, M27. No. Yeah. This is the uh, Eagle Nebula. This is one of the first ones I ever achieved. It was in the parking lot of Star Arizona during the training night. And here it's ob quite obvious the, uh, the tilt that you get from uh, stacking 44 frames of 15 seconds each. Yeah, uh, you should bring up the uh, dark level. Okay. If you can get, you want it so the, all this gray areas look black, even if you lose a little bit of detail, it'll come out a much True. sharper image. Yeah. Okay. So you would take black or darkness over uh, sharpness, I guess. Yeah, we're using different terminology because we're using different software packages. But I like mm -hmm. I said, when I only get something like this, I'll con move the, the, the dark end. So anything under a certain shade is just defined as a zero, zero color. Okay. So, so you'll, 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 wind up losing, you... you'll lose a couple of faint stars, but you'll get rid of all the uh, haze. Okay. Yeah. So if I had to, if I had saved a FITS file of this stack, then I could go back and essentially play with it that way, right? But now yeah. that this is a, a essentially a compressed file, it's not going to so, do much good. What I do is I'll take the pictures, get a set of five to ten, or sometimes even as many fifty frames. Uh, do the dark and flat and bias to them, stack them, save it as a fit, and then do all the processing and save the result of the process as a JPEG. Okay. And I'll keep the fits for forever. Okay. So I always, I hit, the fits has no real processing, so I can always go back and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. I used uh, deep sky, uh, sorry, yeah, deep sky stacking, and it takes the fit files and and basically, I can produce a fit uh, stacked uh, object or a TIFF file, and then I can process it in a variety of uh, okay. software packages. Uh, if you're using a color camera, I don't think there's any difference. If you're using f uh, color filters, stick with fits because it lets you put in narrow band filters also. Uh, with fits. With any anything other than fits, you're just allowed three colors. Okay. With fits, you can hold an infinite number of different frame, uh, overlays, which is why it's used for scientific applications. It also uses a lot of memory. Okay. Oh, let's see. I think my computer is locked up. Oh, no. There's the M51. There's the, uh, th this was from a recent star party, this, these two. Uh, I can't get them in the same frame. <laughs> so I have to take two different pictures. This, the uh, Hercules gl uh, globular cluster. Now that one, there, it wouldn't stack because it couldn't find enough stars. And that's one, one frame at five seconds. So that I just grabbed. So this is a lonely frame that you got. Yes. Uh, this is where last June I was, this is a picture of, uh, I captured uh, a look for and captured. Now that the picture's for shit, but that right there is the supernova that was in M61 last June, May. Mm. Okay. So for me, it's, I never would have seen that in an eyepiece. So even though the picture's, blue and the galaxy looks for crap, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, to me, just to be able to see the supernova was uh, impressive. So this is, this is the great conjunction. And you can see that with the, uh, the focal reducer and, and the way it is right now, the, uh, the planets are too small. I need to, uh, essentially maybe replace the focal reducer with a Barlow and, and uh, 
do some planetary work uh, because I, you can't see the, the striping of Jupiter. You can barely tell Saturn, Saturn's an oval because of the rings yeah. and stuff like that. But I'm surprised you didn't get your a planet of, Jupiter, uh, of Saturn, oh, not a planet, but a moon of Saturn there as well. Uh, yeah, but by the time I adjusted the, the gain up or the, the exposure so you could capture the, 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 uh, the problem you get in is Saturn and Jupiter are terribly different uh, brightnesses. <laughs> yeah. Orders of magnitude almost, I think. So by the time I'd get this one, then, then Jupiter would be blown out almost. So I don't know. Wow. It's my inexperience, so. I was going to suggest you might want to look at some other uh, stacking programs also. There's okay. some that there's some where you can actually see, pick three stars in each picture on your own where you decide which three stars are the same and it'll align to those. And it'll even compensate for different tilts in the pictures or different scale factors on the pictures. Oh, okay. And there's an automated version where it actually does it on its own, just trying to match as many stars as possible. Uh, so I'll normally shoot at different uh, binning rates and it'll still stack them. Okay. Okay. Uh, here are several uh, websites that I've, I've found that are pretty good. What I'll do is I'll publish those in the, uh, in that conference thing that we we've got floating around to people. So yeah. uh, it might be, it might be also good, Bob, uh, if uh, Ryan would just create a small section, which is where we could accumulate these things uh, for for EAA or astrophotography too. So yeah, I, easier to go to. I think I think we need to get some uh, a Dewey Decimal System or some kind of <coughs> organization for that resource page because it's now it's just kind of a, yeah, otherwise, it becomes a mismatch. Just a long, otherwise it becomes a long list and it's hard to find things. Right. So, so maybe yeah. we can make that uh, suggestion to uh, Bob and Robert and Ryan. Uh, yeah. To organize it, but I'll I'll publish this list versus. Yeah, that'd be good. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that ends the uh, the thing. Let me unshare and bring everybody back in focus here. So. Uh, so for me, this was very useful because <laughs> I've got uh, a special <laughs> plan with my grandson who is who is ten years old, and I'm going to do some live stacking for the first time with him. So it was it was uh, it was good to see that. I'm going to be using the ASI Studio, which is in the ASI Air Pro and see how they go. It's good, okay. thank you, Bob. Yeah, and, and Bruce, if you could publish that, if you knew that stacking program that allows you to pick your own or, or a new flexibility, you know. I, I have to go back and find it. It's one I just played with a while back because normally I just use the Maxim to do my stacking for me. Okay, well, no what rush. You, uh, Bruce, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, what do you use for stacking? I normally use Maxim for everything. Maxim. M-A-X-I-M-D-L. Okay. It's, it's a fairly expensive program, but it, it controls the telescope, does the uh, mm -hmm. the processing, does the tracking. Okay. Uh, let's me uh, put in a definition of an object, and it'll try. It'll uh, uh, salute to it. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't recommend it for beginners. Yeah. Hey, Larry, uh, you've been using Nina re recently. Does that do live stacking too? I haven't got that far with it. Okay. Um, what you could do, though, is you could set up DSS, uh, Deep Sky Stacker. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's two flavors when you install it. One that you um, stack everything that you identify. The other one you can stack based on files that, as they show up in a directory. So you could actually set it up that way to do a stack also. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of problem with stacking and stretching. My colors are just going way out on the left field. So I've got some work to do here. <laughs> Uh, any other questions for Bob? So Bob, uh, you've recorded this and we'll, we'll put it on, uh, you send you a link or send, 